to welcome to Petrus 53 on the road and today we are in Django Fest. We certainly are. 2010, 10 years, but especially uh, with this 100 years mm -hmm. anniversary of Django Reinhardt. So, you're a jazz man, but you uh, like gypsy jazz, you like so much... Uh, I love it, you know, I first, I first heard my first Django Reinhardt record when I was about 12 years old and, wow. and it's always been a part of my musical makeup, you know, it's just part of my vocabulary and spirit, you know. And what do you think of so many uh, player, I mean Django could play fast of course, but yeah. he could play very, from the heart, very good melody. Absolutely. And... He had uh, so, so many, you know, the more I listen to him over the years, the more I hear so many subtleties in his playing. Uh, he could play the simplest melody soulfully and just the slightest inflection, great sense of dynamics, and uh, also a great sense of humor in his playing too. We would, you know, occasionally just take a certain idea and develop it very logically or illogically, just, you know, just an amazing sense of humor and musicality. Mm. Yeah. So what do you think it will happen if he, if he passed away about the same time that uh, Grappelli did, so another almost 30, 40 years extra. It's hard to say, you know, he could have gone so many different directions, you know. I mean, even, I understand, I didn't even realize until recently when I read, read one of the new books about him that, uh, that one of his last recordings was actually uh, grooming him to be part of this jazz and philharmonic tour yeah. to Europe with a bunch of these great American jazz men, Flip Phillips, Oscar Peterson, you know. Yeah. Would have been an amazing combination, you know, and I think that Django would have an, had an amazing influence on their their spirit, and vice versa. He would have absorbed a lot of a lot more vocabulary and feeling, and would have gotten even wider known, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to tell. And of course, his uh, his sound on the everybody knows him and loves him for his acoustic guitar yeah. sound, but his sound on the electric guitar was completely unique and amazing too. Yeah. You know? Especially in the recording of '51, '52, like yeah. those later one or sure, those, yeah. yeah. People focus sometimes, they snapshot on one little capsule, like 36, 37, 38, and right. they, there's so many other periods. Absolutely, I mean, that was, that was a wonderful, incredible period, but that was really less than half of his whole recorded output, you know? Yeah. You know so, uh, it's just, uh, it's just a, it's a wonderful uh, resource to keep drawing upon for inspiration and uh, enjoyment. Yeah. Uh, many uh, people uh, like me 10 years ago we discovered Django through the music you did for the Sweet and Lowdown uh, movie. What do you think of people that discover Django sometime in a non, I would say, non-classical way, but... I think that whatever, what, everybody comes from a slightly different place. I mean, everybody plays the guitar from a slightly different beginning, too. And, uh, it, it sur pleasantly surprised me the amount of influence that had doing that movie because I knew that the music would be featured prominently. I didn't know it would be so prominently yeah. in the film. I didn't know it would be so out front. And it's just really gratifying to know that so many people liked the music and were drawn to research and get more into it. Yeah. You know? uh, so it's, I think it's, it's really just an indication of how powerful a great film can be in, in terms of affecting a lot of people, you know, are getting a message across. The fact that it was a well-known, currently hip actor like Sean Penn playing the part yeah. really did a lot to make it, to make it, uh, I don't know if the word is stylish, but just make it like even more acceptable for someone to say, yeah. wow, Sean Penn's playing a part of this guitar player, it must be really cool. Yeah. yeah. What do you think of his finger work? Is that <laughs> That's another story. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I, to tell you the truth, I was hired to, to teach Sean Payne how to play the guitar for his part in the role, because he'd never played the guitar at all. Well, he did, I mean. And, and he did, and he could play a lot of the things note for note just by sheer hard work. He was an amazingly wow. dedicated student. The problem was Woody Allen's modus operandi is not to give a lot of information to people involved in his films in advance. For instance, when I was working with Sean a few months before the film started shooting, yeah. he said, hey, have you seen the script? I said, no, I haven't. He said, well, that's ridiculous. You should see, should see the script. So by reading the script, I knew what the film was about. It, before that, I just knew it was kind of vaguely about Django. I didn't know it was about this fictitious character yeah, yeah, yeah. in the whole story. 
Image Ray. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the thing is, I knew we had recorded a number of tunes. I was trying to teach Sean how to play the guitar. I could only teach him a limited number of tunes. I didn't know what tunes he would be exactly. filming. Yeah. So as a result, Sean could play this tune perfectly. Uh, the theme song. He could play the melody perfectly, the whole chorus. Yes. He could play it a little bit. But the, the camera never went near his hands on that number. Some of the other tunes, I found out that morning, okay, and the, we were going to be recording Rap Your Troubles and Dreams. I'd do a crash course with him and say, well, can you remember this? And he tried. He said, well, I can kind of approximate chords and single notes when I hear them. And sometimes I'd be off screen while he's filming or off camera, and he'd be looking over trying to get an idea of what part of the neck to put his hands in. If I'd known what exactly. tunes we were More filming, I could have focused on those tunes. So he was a good student. Wow. He was an amazingly great wow. student. He, he, could, he could play like three or four of the tunes. He could play like a chorus of the melody, note for note, just by sheer hard work and focus and determination. Uh, we want one of the final scenes of the movie. He could play this little thing in chords. Oh, yeah. I had him doing that. And the camera didn't go near his hands on that thing. It was all in his facial expressions. He's a good actor, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. So. So having said that, that's just my excuse for the, the reason uh, that, that his no, the, In the circle of Gypsy yeah. Dash, there was lots of talk about it, but I think the old point is it got attention to, right. to the music. And I, I, think, I thank you for that, that's for oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank, oh, thank Woody Allen, thank, thank, yeah. thank Dick Hyman for suggesting me to the job of recording yeah. and for teaching John Penn. So you will play tonight with uh, Bucky Cerelli? Yep. And Bria Schoenberg. Yeah. Having a good time with uh, this, uh, this group there? Always. You know, yeah. Bria I met several years ago and actually tried to get her, her up to Django Fest several years ago and it wasn't until last year that she was finally available mm -hmm. at this time. And uh, she's gotten into it wholeheartedly. She moved, learned some different tunes and researched more of the, the style and yeah. the repertoire and tradition. Bucky is an old colleague. I've known him for 30 years. We wow. played together a lot for almost 20 years. So it's it's and he's having a great time just being here and seeing everybody. Yeah, such yeah. a gentleman. I don't know. He is. Yeah. Well, man, thanks for your time, Howard, and then I wish you a good show. It will be a good show I'm tonight. Sure we'll and have a good time. Yeah. Great to be here with you. So, like I say, keep listening to good gypsy jazz, drinking some good wine, having some good food, and enjoying. Live and keep watching Fashion 53 on the road.